Are we on Pringle's array when we try to solve the history of the French working class movement before 1914? A pertinent question, really, because on first glance, that history or that story of the French socialist movement in the pre-war decades really looks like some kind of a very pale and a very mediocre variant of that very booming epic of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. In other words, we're saying that we're dealing here with a French socialist movement which doesn't even develop a unified party by 1905, which certainly never enrolled even as much as one tenth of the membership of the German Socialist Party, and which certainly never governed over that kind of state within a state which was so much the pride of German social democracy. And even after all, when you look at the periodization of that French socialist movement, it looks as though it really is only a copy or a pale version of the German movement. Because in the decade of the 1880s, which is a decade, as we know, of depression, which is a decade when it looks as though the system is in deep trouble, the socialist movement is divided into very tiny little groups or parties that are more like sects, which really are apocalyptic, which really are revolutionary, which think that the system is really going to collapse imminently. And the most important of those groups, and not very important at that, was the group that we call the Deadists, named after Gilles Dead, who was, after all, the leader of that particular party. And the Geddes were the French Marxists, and they organized a little party in 1880 called the Parti Oublier Francais, the French Workers' Party. But I tell you that that French Workers' Party, by 1889, had only 2,000 members, and that it didn't really grow into a party until 10 years later, when it could count 16,000 members. But that, after all, when it had begun to scale down its program, when it had begun to trim its program to the realities of electoral needs. And next to those Geddes were Blanquistes, those who claimed to follow Blanqui. And they weren't even as big as the Geddes, because if the French Marxists, after all, had certain kinds of sectors up in the mining and the textile areas of the Nord and the Pas de Calais, if they were in the south, in the Midi of France, in certain of the metal sectors, the Blanquistes were visible only in the city of Paris, and as a matter of fact, toward the end of the 1880s, had really almost put themselves out of business by the great attraction that Boulangism had for some of the leaders of this little sect of Blanquistes. And the only thing that really kept these Blanquistes together was the rather dominant personality and the very great intelligence of Edouard Bayant, Bayant really one of the significant figures in French socialism before 1914, a doctor by profession, but who was a communal, who had read Marx and understood Marx perfectly well, and who ultimately had a tremendous sense of praxis, a tremendous sense of what a strategy of action is really about. And next to these little revolutionary groups, you get the one group of reformists, known as the possibilists, those who believe in what is possible, those who have no grandiose ideas, those who are the followers of another doctor called Paul Blues, and who develop a strategy that is really anchored in municipalization. That if, after all, these socialists can capture the municipal councils, that gradually they can municipalize the public utilities, they can municipalize the transport, they can make for better socially conscious cities, they can make what in Milwaukee used to be called at the turn of the century sewer socialism, in other words, run the cities perfectly well, and that kind of possibilism certainly existed there in the 1880s. And next to them, of course, the Ottomanis, because the Ottomanis broke off from these followers of Paul Bruce, and they were the followers of Jean Alleman, who himself was a, a printer, a worker, an extremely elegant guy, a very real working class militant. And these Alemanis are always distinguished in French socialism because they are what we call ouvreristes. In other words, they have really a working class base. And they have all kinds of suspicion of members of the socialist movement who are workers. They have suspicion of intellectuals, of functionaries, of leaders, of deputies, of elections. They are the socialists who are closest 
to revolutionary syndicalism, uh, to the idea that you really can use uh, the general strike in order to transform society. And of course, next to these Alemanis, the anarchists, uh, the anarchists was to all kinds of rational political goals like elections or organizing for votes and who in the 1880s are off in a very strange tactical line called propaganda by the deed. In other words, individual acts of terrorism in order to advertise the degeneracy of the capitalistic system. Now all of these groups, except the possibilists, have two things in common that they are revolutionary uh, from the point of view that they believe in the imminent collapse of the system and secondly that they believe that the revolution will be a violent mass revolution that someday there will be and not too far away there will be that mass uprising which will produce what was called in those years Le Grand Soir, the great evening which is going to introduce the dawn you see of a new day and if they quarreled with each each other. It was about means rather than about ends, uh, because the anarchists uh, quarreled with the Gettys and the Blanquist over the question of elections. Uh, they said any electoral campaigns are bad uh, because they are a snare for the workers. Uh, workers begin to think you can gain something through elections, uh, whereas the Gettys and the Blanquist, they were following the German Social Democratic line in those 1880s that, after all, elections are a way in which you advertise, you propagandize your particular message, and you prepare the workers for that revolution. But you see, that decade changed, just as it did in Germany. And the 1890s are a whole other affair. That the parties get bigger, that the practice gets more reformist, that you begin to accommodate socialism much more to the ongoing society. How to explain it? In large measure, of course, the change in the conjuncture. And that has three very important consequences. When you begin to get, first of all, a lightening of that economic atmosphere, when it is perfectly apparent that the depression is ending and that capitalism has staying power, then the idea of the apocalypse begins to fade away. Then you realize that capitalism will be around for a while. And consequently, the socialists have to adapt to that. They have to begin to develop a more comprehensive, a more reformist program, if you please. And in the second place, that change in the conjuncture introduces a whole new inflationary cycle. An inflationary cycle in which prices go up and consequently it is possible to wrench from the capitalists and wrench from the parliament certain concessions for the workers. In other words, things that would be resisted in a depression period are more readily given. I don't mean to say, because it's not true, that real wages of French workers Workers really went up in the period, let us say, between 1895 and 1914. The real wages were constantly being kept at a certain level because of inflation. The money wages that were increased constantly bitten away by the inflationary cycle. But what I'm saying is that there are more social reforms, reforms that begin to protect workers in factories or in mines, and consequently, in the mentality of the working class, begins to develop the idea that improvements are important, and that who knows, maybe step by step, one can evolve toward a new society. And the third consequence of that shift in the conjuncture, the development of a new white color class, in other words, of a new petty bourgeoisie. I'm talking about functionaries, both in the private and public sector. I'm talking about clerks. I'm talking about teachers. Functionaries who do two things that moderate socialist strategy. One is that that expansion of the tertiary sector, that expansion of the new white-color lower middle class, 
That is like a canal of social advancement for the blue-collar worker. The children of the blue-collar worker can begin to aspire to becoming a postier in the post office, to working in a bank or something of that kind. And so, little by little, that very radical alienation that really is the chasm between the working class and organized society begins to be somewhat narrow. But more than that, there are recruits from this new petty bourgeoisie. They go into the Socialist Party, and because they are better educated, they often become the leaders, they become the journalists, they become the deputies, and they don't have a practice of frontal struggle the way blue-collar workers do, and they begin to moderate the entire program, the entire strategy of French socialism. So the shift in the conjuncture really is crucial. But add to that a second factor, and that is success itself. And I'm talking about success at elections. You see, that already was a vision at the time of Boulanger's because Boulangerism meant that you could go and develop a mass movement to make election victories. In other words, it pointed to a mass base on the left for electoral victories. And then the evidence was apparent within the socialist movement itself. You take the municipal elections of 1892, when the Geddes, for example, won 22 city halls, won 600 municipal councillors. You take the uh, general elections for the legislature of 1893, when 50 socialist deputies go into the chamber of deputies, and you're talking about something that is fascinating to the socialists. You see, they begin to think, if we trim our program, if we cast our net wider, if we go after those peasants, if we go after those petty bourgeois, maybe we can get, finally, one day, that majority in the legislature and maybe that majority will be the revolution. Maybe it will be the Consois. And so here, in the POF, in the Parti Ouvrier Francais, the so-called Marxist party, which is supposed to be so very pure in a revolutionary sense, begins to trim its sails to make election victories in the 1890s. There we are, in 1894, at the Congress of Nantes, of the Parti Ouvrier Francais, and the peasant question is brought up for discussion. Now you know, as good Marxist revolutionaries, these uh, Geddes in the 1880s had always said that we can't endure a nation of small peasants. They're going to disappear. That kind of land holding simply cannot be the base for a socialist society. We must have collectivization of the land. But here they're trying to win the support of peasants and the program changes to the great chagrin of Engels who was still alive. And at Nantes in 1894, the Geddes made an outrageous direct appeal to the peasants by saying, we are your friends. We are for, because we are Marxists, we are for small property holding, and consequently, we will assure you cheap credit and lower taxes on your land. And that is accompanied, you see, even by a shift in the anti-patriotic line. Because certainly these revolutionaries in the 1880s were always anti-patriotic. They followed that line in Marx that said the workers have no fatherland, that the fatherland of the worker is the international proletariat, and consequently they have no business worshipping the flag or going off into national wars. And here, by the mid-1890s, is Gilles and Paul Lafayette talking to workers and saying that we, the French Marxists, are really the heirs of the Jacobins of 1793. That we will always defend the frontier and we will make a revolution while we defend that particular frontier. And all of that, you see, culminates in a strategy that is increasingly reformist, increasingly electoral, and it is very bluntly stated as such. It is bluntly stated as such at Saint-Mandé, as I indicated toward the end of last hour. 
And that is so important because the French socialists really went on record. And they went on record in a most curious way. They had that banquet on the 31st of May of 1896, and they felt that since they were celebrating their recent victories in the municipal elections, that what they ought to do is to set a kind of common line, a common political line, that would enable them to increase their electoral victories. And the person they asked to do that was a very hard-headed lawyer called Alexandre de Leon. And that's very significant, because Villeron has no militant experience whatsoever. He never goes to a strike field. He's not that kind of person. This is a bourgeois lawyer who is a refugee from the radical Republicans, who has joined the Socialist Party, as many people join the Socialist Movement, for careerist purposes, to find a place there, to exploit that place, who became more and more moderate in order to keep that place, and then finally just abandon the whole movement when he found a place in the establishment itself. This Millevon, I tell you, becomes one of the most reactionary political personages before World War I, an ardent militarist, an ardent chauvinist, and after the First World War, in the wake of the Russian Revolution, the most reactionary president of the Third Republic that you really have in the period of the 1920s. And yet it is this Millevon who is asked to draw up this common denominator called the saint Bande program, and he does, and it is Jews' violence, and it will have nothing to do with direct mass action, and it says nothing about internationalism, and Millevon weaves that very frayed cloth of universal suffrage as the material of the social revolution. Step by step, reform by reform, you get the picture. And they all bought that. Well, isn't that all there is to say? Because fundamentally, that is the German movement in miniature. And you might say that the Germans colonized the world socialist movement. And yet, you see, if you look a little bit more closely, if you look at closer glance, you see that there's something very complex about this movement, and rather much richer than you think at the beginning. Not only because the working class itself, when it organized unions, didn't organize reformist trade unions, but revolutionary unions, but more than that, because within the French socialist movement, there was the radiation of that very important moral and intellectual influence of Jean Jaurès. And that really is important within the framework of French socialism, and I think really of European socialism too. Because you see that Jaurès was a reformist, but something more. He was a parliamentarian, but really something more. He was an idealist, and yet more than any Marxist in France, he understood what revolutionary praxis was, as it was understood by Karl Marx himself. You see, you cannot come to grips with Jaurès unless you separate him from certain others. You must separate him, for example, from all of those who make a career in a movement. All of those who went in, the same socialist class as Jaurès, who came from the bourgeoisie, who saw a good thing, who protected their positions, and finally abandoned the movement when they found a better position in the establishment. I'm talking about Emilia, I'm talking about Viviani, I'm talking about Aristide Briand, all of whom became such enemies of the working class. Now you've got to understand that this Jaurès had more opportunity to sell out than anybody. He was constantly beckoned into that establishment. Why not? The man was perfectly brilliant and had a cultivation second to none. And here he was with all of this immense culture, and what in hell was he doing it? Applying it to a revolutionary movement or to a socialist movement. And so all of his life, there were those requests and there were those taunts. And I remember that encounter, for example, that he had in a literary salon one day with Marcel Proust. And you can't imagine how funny that is, because Marcel Proust, who had a brief moment, a brief flick, 
of sort of semi-socialism at the time of the Dreyfus Affair, and certainly had known about Jaurès. And he saw Jaurès and he went up with his very, very peculiarly uh, uh, otherworldly approach. And he said, Ah, Monsieur Jaurès, you know you want to make this revolution, but if you do, what then will happen to my magnificent collection of paintings? <laughs> Jaurès said, well, we'll let us make the revolution, you will keep them. <laughs> and it was the same, you see, with Barres. And there was this Barres, for example, who really couldn't fathom the idea that Jaurès was in this socialist movement. Barres had incredible admiration for the kind of intellectual prowess that Jaurès had. And they stood together in 1910 in the Chamber of Deputies, and Barres turned to him and he said, how is it that you can betray the tradition? You who know philosophy, you who know theology, you who know letters, you who know the whole history, after all, of our tradition, how can you betray it, after all, by posing a revolution that will destroy it? And Jaurès, in words that really can't be repeated in English because they really lose so much, but said in effect, in French, said in effect that after all, Monsieur Barrex, what you're talking about are the dead ashes. The tradition you're talking about are the dead ashes. And socialism, that is the living flame, and that will ignite human beings. And even if some of these dead ashes are swept out, no bother at all, and no trouble at all. And so it's not surprising that you get the very best text that I know anything about on renegadism from Jaurès. And get the picture, because you see, he had in the early, in the 1890s, he'd been on many platforms with guys like Mitterrand and guys like Viviani and Briand, who really hung on to his coattails all the time. And he'd been lectured to all kinds of workers' groups or raided, and these had been his comrades. Now they were all in the establishment. And it's 1910, and it's October, and the railroad workers have tried to make that very important rail strike of 1910. And Briand is the Prime Minister, and Milleland is the Minister of War, and Viviani is the Minister of the Interior. And they all line up and they crush this rail strike. Or what they do is to call in troops to work as scabs, and then they threaten to conscript these uh, railroad workers into the army, and the strike collapses. And so Jonas won't let it go by. And there is that great debate that takes place on the 29th of October of 1910, in which he stands of the Tribune and then points to Briand, the Prime Minister, and on the same bench to Milleval de Viviani, and says this about what it is when workers, after all, who have had confidence in you, and you, after all, have given them that sense of hope or vision, how it is when they suddenly find that they're being crushed by you. I remember, says Jaurès, though you who are men of power have probably forgotten it, how we spoke side by side at overflow meetings of workers. I remember the old workers in those crowds, all of them now dead, grizzled men near the end of their lives, who knew they would never see a better day. But I remember those young ones, 14 and 16 and 18 years old, their eyes ablaze with hope when they heard our program. Today they're 30 or 35, and when they read in the papers that you, Briand and Milleval and Viviani, the ones who once kindled their brightest hopes, are out there breaking their strikes, they surely must be asking themselves if life isn't, after all, a long and bitter hoax. And consequently, you see, you've got to separate somebody to begin to understand. You almost cannot understand such people in their own terms. And the same is true to separate him from those who passed as the Marxists. Because, au fond, he was a better Marxist than they, by far. Those Geddes especially were so mediocre. And they sat in their splendid isolation, saying we are revolutionaries, and never really mounted a strategy of revolution at all. And it was Jaurès, the idealist, the reformist, and so forth, who was saying, now we cannot, for, ever, for heaven's sake, we cannot eliminate the strategy of the mass strike, of the general strike, and especially not in regard to war. Workers does not, after all, be sent off to their carnage without some kind of a very direct confrontation. You see, Jaurès is time-bound. 
He is a man of his time. There is no question about it. He died in 1914, which means that he didn't live through that First World War, and he didn't live through the Russian Revolution of 1917, which so badly damaged all of that faith in the democratic dogma and in evolutionary socialism. But the point that I make to you is that even in that more illusionary period before 1914, he understood that democracy by itself had its limitations. He had no sanguinity about those ruling classes collaborating in their own extinction. He knew that it would take more than that, maybe even violence. What is Jolassisme? Jolassisme, if you please, is continuous and variegated action. What it is, is a continuous assault, a penetration of the system in order to try to sap it from within, an assault from without, by whatever means, after all, are to be established. And he says all this in a marvelous text in Cosmopolis in February of 1898. And he's talking about those really revolutionaries that sit by the wayside and say too much contact, after all, may be a corrupting thing. And Jarlesse replies this way, we'll never control the future by isolating ourselves from reality. We have to push the internal contradictions to their limits through constant and variegated action. Only by the intervention of the masses will capitalist society be overthrown, a statement that almost could have been taken verbatim out of Trotsky, out of the history of the Russian Revolution. Only that intervention of the mass, after all, becomes the ultimate and the crucial element. Are they just words? And are they just vague words? Well, then we must be precise and we must really make the specifics. And so we must, for example, talk about what the Jaurès effort was at the epoch of the Dreyfus Affair. Because that is really crucial. Because that is an effort to do something quite important to build a strong and unified socialist movement, if possible, in order to spearhead a mass assault on the repressive machinery of society. Now you see, we are touching very close to home. We are touching to something that is directly and daily in our lives. The more that I look at that history over and over again of the Dreyfus Affair, which for periods of time began to disappear from my mind as being really quite historic and not interesting, but the more I come back to it, the more it becomes apparent that it speaks very much to the day. Because, you see, the Dreyfus Affair is like a kind of trial run for Watergate, like a kind of trial run for those 15 or 20 years of CIA covert operations. Like a trial run, if you please, for a whole schema of political assassination of foreign revolutionaries or of uncomfortable political leaders at home. The point is, with the Dreyfus Affair, you are into a very continuous exercise in raison d'etat, in public lying, and in what we now call cover-up that you are into, after all, a kind of conspiracy to protect the establishment from too much open and critical thinking, from too much public discussion, from too much intervention by the popular classes into the political process. And Jaurès understood that. And what he tried to do was to get the socialists to exploit that Dreyfusard movement to aim itself directly at what he understood to be at the center of the problem, that there is the complicity of certain administrative organs always, that there is an interconnection, an interlacing network of repressive institutions that is hidden from the eye. And you have to bring that out to naked attention, and you have to begin to rip that apart.
hard. Now, he wasn't very successful, but it was fantastic that he identified the problem and that he thought, really, that the socialists could make tremendous, tremendous capital out of heading that kind of a movement. And you see, if you compare that with our own circumstances, you realize in what a politically pathetic state we're in. Because daily, after all, Americans are fed all kinds of information that tell them that every day of their lives they're manipulated or lied to. The amounts of information that bombard you about this daily when you have these investigations are enormous. And what is the net effect? Who is saying, for example, that you have to dismantle the CIA, that you have to dismantle the FBI? Who is even saying you have to purge it? And you see, all of this underscores a very fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is that there are no politics in America, and never will be, until there is a mass party of the left. There cannot be any politics short of that kind of a debate. And consequently, it's within the framework of what Charles tried to do in the Dreyfus Affair, that it really touches very close to the heart of what our mission is or what our problem is if we are ever to create a viable politics within the cadre of the society. What was the Dreyfus Affair? We all know in general. But in brief, okay. The opening date is the 15th of October of 1894. And on that date, there is an army captain called Alfred Dreyfus, who is of a rich Jewish family, a rather brilliant officer, one of the very few Jews in an officer corps that didn't take kindly to them kind, and consequently, Drake was suddenly isolated, and on that 15th of October, accused of having passed military secrets to German diplomacy. Uh, the evidence against him was a document which turned out to be, of course, the very famous Baudelaire, the document known as the Baudelaire, which is an unsigned document and is simply a list of the military secrets that the writer of this Baudelaire, or this list, is going to pass on to the recipient of this paper, who was Colonel Schwarzkopf, who was the military attaché in the German embassy. And that particular particular document had been fished out of Schwarzkopf's wastebasket uh, by the char lady who was in the pay of French intelligence. And consequently, she passed it back to them, and they took it into consideration. And of course, ultimately it was known that that gold of o was written by one Commandant Esther Hasse. Esther Hasse, who really is uh, a kind of condo carry, uh, who is an adventurer, full of debts, loves women, loves gambling, and is full of debts and has these very high-ranking protectors in the general staff of the French army. But that isn't the person that was fingered by the inquiry committee of the general staff on the basis of handwriting experts' testimony. They disagreed, but there were enough who said that the handwriting was Dreyfus's. And on the basis of the internal evidence that the secrets that were to be passed really were the kinds of information that Dreyfus would have, he was accused of the treason. He was brought to a court martial. The court martial concluded on the 22nd of December of 1894, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment in Devil's Island. As far as the socialists are concerned, at that point, there was not one single question, quite obviously, about the legitimacy of that conviction, except in one sense, that in the Chamber of Deputies there was one socialist named Castellan, who was broadly applauded by all the others, including Charles, who said, you see, if Dreyfus had been a common soldier and not an officer, he would have been executed. It just goes to show that there is prejudice. And consequently, at that point, everybody agrees that the army has found a spot. How does that particular case become the Dreyfus affair? It becomes the affair on the basis of the intervention of a certain number of very heroic people who decide Dreyfus is innocent. Uh, you get it through the press by 1896 and 7. You get it, for example, in that magnificent brochure of Bernard Lazare, 
Chazal himself is Jewish, but he has no affiliation with Judaism at all. He is a very devout anarchist, a man of tremendous probity, and he was convinced of Dreyfus's uh, innocence on the basis of too many contradictions, uh, too many contradictions in the evidence. He was like one of those people you know who investigates the Kennedy assassination on the basis of what's printed. And so he wrote a brochure, couldn't print it in France, printed it in Brussels, but sent it off to leading intellectuals, leading parliamentary guys, and consequently got the whole issue out into public life somewhat. A year later, in November of 1897, it's the brother of Alfred Dreyfus, who is called Mathieu Matthew Dreyfus, who always believed in the innocence of Dreyfus, who writes a very, very courageous article in the newspaper The Figaro, in which he does finger Esther Hasey, and he says all of the evidence and all of the proof really points to him as the guilty one. The result was there was enough proof, aha, by that time that the general staff had to court martial Esther Hasey. They had a second spy for the same treason. And consequently, at Esther Hasey's court martial, which was the 10th of January of 1898, they weren't quite sure that they could get away by saying that the board below wasn't written by Esther Hasey, so they suddenly had another document. They had a very wily little guy named Colonel Joseph Henri. Colonel Henry and Colonel Ozzy, uh, who really was a bad man anyway, uh, was dashing about fabricating all of these false documents. Well, that is, had he lived years later, he wouldn't have worked on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. John <laughs> <laughs> Lee produced another document. Uh, this had uh, Dreyfus' initial in it. It talked about Sakanai Day, uh, this, uh, this uh, scum day, or D, uh, which obviously had to mean Dreyfus. And of course, it was perfectly obvious such a crude forgery. It was really pieced together from two other papers. One happened to be green and the other blue. Uh, but it suffices to say uh, that for this particular court martial, it was sufficient, and Esther Hasse was acquitted. Well, that brings a third intervention, which is very explosive. Because when Esther Hasse was acquitted on the 10th of January, a one day court martial, Zola was enraged. And consequently, Zola intervened with a tremendous bombshell uh, with his great uh, full. Uh, full uh, uh, issue article uh, in the newspaper A Law, uh, which was called J'accuse. I accuse, uh, which appeared then on the 13th of January, uh, was a tremendous, a tremendous attack, a tremendous arraignment uh, on the army chief of staff, uh, on the entire general staff, uh, on the government for not only uh, accusing the wrong person, but also for the cover-up. In other words, the whole Watergate syndrome really begins uh, with that Zola piece uh, called Jacques, that you are systematically in the business of cover-up, uh, you don't want the truth really ever to get out. And consequently, the government at the time uh, was the government of Jules Pelin, who uh, was a complete reactionary, and for two years uh, had had a very repressive ministry. And so, when Zola did that, they said, well, this is really shaking the boat. Uh, the army is being attacked, the government is being attacked. And so, Zola was accused under the press law of 1881 of undermining the security of the state, uh, was brought to trial, and sentenced to a year in prison. Uh, which he never served because he fled to London. Uh, but it suffices to say uh, that the cover-up was really going full steam, uh, that Steve Roller really was in action. Then, uh, through 1898, uh, begins to develop a certain intellectual sector of Dreyfusau. Uh, you get it, for example, in the Lee Dum, uh, in the École Normale Supérieure. You get a bunch of young intellectual socialists, very interesting types, uh, like the poet Charles Pédi, uh, the future historian Albert Mathieu, uh, the anthropologist Marcel Mauss. Uh, these are young men who begin to look at something that really is important. That if you get a real movement going out of this, that maybe you can create a counterculture in the society. That really you have to somehow undermine that ideological hegemony of the ruling class. Uh, you have to get the workers persuaded uh, that there really is a repressive machinery at the center of society. And they begin to integrate themselves into the affair. And these young intellectual socialists have a 
a big influence upon Jolex because he had been holding back up to that time and right after the Zola peace uh, he wrote in La Langue Town about these young Normandiens, about these young Dreyfusel. I applaud those young people who aren't afraid to set themselves against the arbitrary power of the army, the courts, the bureaucracy, the police. I can only apologize for having hesitated so long myself, although there were reasons, as we see, why Jolas hesitated. Now, the wheels of the whole affair, from that point on, grind very, very slowly because Though all kinds of evidence is introduced. You see, what difference does it make? I mean, how much evidence do we need, for example, that the Warren Commission report is shot full of holes? I mean, you know, if we hear it anymore, it's going to come out of our tongues. And consequently, you know, all of this goes on and on and on. It was the same thing with the Dreyfus affair. Everybody who was getting into the act, writing about, questioning this particular document or that particular document, and consequently, it should have meant a revision of the trial very, very quickly, but it isn't until the 3rd of June of 1899 uh, that the Appeals Court, the United Appeals Court, says that Dreyfus must have a second trial. That is, he must have a second court-martial. That there's enough evidence to indicate that maybe the first court-martial had slipped up and made an error. And consequently, the second court-martial is held in the city of Lang in July of 1899, and the verdict is really astonishing. Once again, Dreyfus is called guilty, is judged guilty, but with extenuating circumstances, which is that somebody else did it. Uh, <laughs> which means that the life imprisonment is reduced to 10 years, and he goes back to Devil's Island, presumably for 10 years. Uh, and it, it really isn't, finally, until the 3rd of September of 1899, uh, that Amy Roubaix, who by that time was the president of the Republic, and really was representing that faction of the bourgeois Republicans that wanted to co-opt this affair, that began to get afraid of how far this affair would go. Roubaix was the president of the Republic then, finally on the 3rd of September of 1899, he pardoned Dreyfus. Now the important thing is, what is at stake? Really, what's at stake in something of that kind? What does the Dreyfus affair and the whole Dreyfus out movement, in terms of social history, in terms of our own living, what does it tell us? First of all, it was a terrific revelation about the apparatus of repressive power. Because what it indicated was that there was an interlocking directorate of three agencies. And they were, of course, the ministry or the government, uh, the courts, uh, and the army. Uh, that they uh, worked together, they protected each other. And that consequently, uh, they covered up for each other, that that really was the core of that repressive power. Now you see, that had been known before, but it hadn't been so overt. Because if you take those three powers, uh, the government, uh, the courts, and the army, you already have what that repressive power is about in the strike fields. When you get the prefect, for example, calling out the troops against a strike, or, uh, let us say, demanding that the courts penalize with very long sentences some of these workers, then quite obviously you have that kind of interlocking directorate of repression. But here in the Dreyfus Affair, it came out very clearly and very brilliantly. Second, but what the affair indicated was that under pressure, the establishment can always count upon the springing forth in a society of a certain amount of irrational ideologies that really support its dominion, that befog the mentality of the public, that really purvey all kinds of divisive values and consequently permit the establishment to survive. I'm talking about the ideologies of occultism, the ideology of racism, the ideology of anti-Semitism, of ultranationalism, and all of those ideologies really sprung out of the ground and really began to gush at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. I talked about occultism, and I swear to God that that really was there. 
that fundamentally, when you're talking about is it terrific, occultism about a hidden syndicate, about a hidden force that really is undermining France. It's the sort of thing we experienced in the Cold War, in the McCarthy era, when there was really that kind of phobia about communists, that they were everywhere, that somehow the spirit, the smell, the sweat of communists had pervaded the ozone. And consequently, <laughs> uh, there's something almost of that at the time of the affair. You get the assumptionist fathers uh, who are a congregation, and you have a very powerful press called La Bonne Press, and the assumptionist fathers in their newspaper La Croix, the Cross, are constantly talking about the party of Satan. The party of Satan, uh, which is at work not only to cause the defeat of France externally, but really to cause her the subversion internally. So you have that kind of a mentality that really can look at the facts and consequently ignore the facts. And it seems to me, uh, you know more about it than I because you are a little closer to the grassroots at times, but there's a lot of that occultism around. And that occultism, for example, that has begun to explain things in the most bizarre way. And at a certain point, when points of crises come, and when certain kinds of rational analyses and certain kinds of modal are spread around, certain kinds of slogans, let's hope, after all, uh, that we're not confronted at every turn uh, with people who are talking about hidden syndicates meeting in caves in Spain or something, uh, which really has a certain kind of quality of divisiveness, a quality, really, of complete obscurity obscuring of the issue. But the second thing, the anti-Semitism was even more important. Because the anti-Semitism really came in a tremendous gusher. And the Dreyfus Affair, of course, was the, uh, was the affair that put that issue of anti-Semitism uh, on the West European map, uh, made it really something of a talking point, something that had to be considered. Now, you see, there weren't very many Jews in France. Uh, by 1897, there were only 71,000 Jews in the country. Uh, 45,000 of them were in Paris. And as a matter of fact, uh, they weren't even a united community. That is, the old Jewish settlers uh, who had been there a long time didn't like the newcomers uh, who came from Eastern Europe, uh, were uh, more Orthodox Jews, but more than that were workers. Uh, were not bourgeois or petty bourgeois, uh, were workers in the hat-making trade or in the tailoring trades uh, living over in the Marais. Uh, but you don't need numbers, you see, uh, and you don't even need unity. Sartre was quite right when he wrote that famous line, you know, in which he said that if the Jew didn't exist, the anti-Semite would have to invent him. Because fundamentally, uh, you don't need Jews to have anti-Semitism. All you need is a situation, uh, and all you need is the need for a scapegoat, all you need is some kind of diversionary tactics. And you don't have a Jew, uh, then you can use somebody else, you can use a black, you can use a, a, a woman, you can use a gay, you can use a Chinese, you can use uh, anything. And consequently, uh, if you can build a case, after all, for the inferiority or for the uh, uh, venality of the person, uh, then quite obviously you've got that kind of scapegoat. Well, anti-Semitism was a, was a natural in France, and it existed a long time, uh, but from very traditional Catholic roots. Good cultural Catholic anti-Semitism, that simply had to do with, with the Christ-killing theme. Uh, but then... Uh, <laughs> such old hat that it doesn't grab anybody up anymore. Uh, so that in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, the mid-19th century, you begin to get a, a sort of another direction to this. You get a certain kind of a rather pernicious socialist anti-Semitism uh, as connected with Boudin, uh, as connected with Toussaint, for example, uh, in a book called A Pop des Bois, uh, which is the identification of the Jew with the banker. Uh, the identification of the Jew with Rothschild, uh, the identification of the Jew with the ultimate exploiter in the society who is very, very parasitical. But what you really get at the time of the Dreyfus Affair, through the 1890s anyway, uh, is the addition of a very real racist theme. Uh, in other words, you get all this pseudo-anthropological stuff, uh, you begin to get uh, theories that Jews are inferior, that they're different, uh, that they can never accommodate, and so forth. And all of those three themes are bound together uh, by the most indefatigable anti-Semite uh, that the French ever produced. You know, it takes a lot out of you, day after day, to run an anti-Semitic newspaper like La Libre Parole, which is eight pages long and has nothing but anti-Semitism in it, and runs for 22 years. You know, you really run out of material at times. There aren't that many Jews. And that's what I mean. uh, the problem is that you have this very indefatigable type called Edmond Limon, 
remark, uh, who really was absolutely uh, uh, boundless and endless and bottomless well, uh, really spouting out what was an absolute historical garbage, uh, and certainly, from the point of view of science, about as pseudoscience as possible, first in a book called La France Week, which was a bestseller, Jewish France, and then in a newspaper, The Free Word, La Libre Parole, uh, which he launched in 1892, and which had a daily circulation of 100,000, and which was nothing but an anti-Semitic newspaper. And so, with Le Monde, you begin to get the idea, as he puts it, that we're on to something very important in terms of the subversion of the society, and that is that Jews are by nature hypocritical, but worse than that, traitors. Uh, that they will lie to you, but secondly, uh, that they will betray the country. And of course, that means uh, that there must be unity inside, that the army must be protected, that all of the forces of order must be protected against dangers of that kind. And that, you see, flows so very easily into ultranationalism, into the ultranationalism of the League of Patriots, of Jehoulet, of the Anti-Semitic League of Guerin, of those people who were already ultra-patriots at the time of the Boulanger's affair, saying that what they wanted was a Parti National, a national party that faced regional differences, he faced class differences, but now they have a way of doing it. They had a way of doing it because they could say we all have to rally together because we are in the presence of these occult forces. We are in the presence of these subversive people. All of these themes begin to interwine and the ultranationalism begins to get a mass audience. And it gets, as you see from that petty bourgeoisie, that pitiful petty bourgeoisie, that old petty bourgeoisie of artisans and of shopkeepers and so forth, who really, who really are so mystified by this new age that is coming who can clutch on to only one value, and that really the value of order. And then with all of this, you begin to get violent street actions. And Jorah sees this, uh, the streets belong to the anti Dreyfusard. Uh, the streets belong to the right. Uh, the streets belong to those who may want to make an ultra-nationalist coup d'etat. And that was perfectly evident on the 4th of June of 1899 at the racetrack in Otoy. Uh, because there was the president, Emile Louvet, who had gone in his presidential robe, uh, had a full dress suit to squash the races. And there was the young aristocratic thug named Christiani, who was obviously buying for immortality, at least he gets mentioned years later. And consequently, he went up with a big club and whacked the president on the head. He turned to Paris City because the high hat went all the way over the face. <laughs> and it suffices to say they had to lead the president out of the box, blinded by this club. But well, all of that, you see, already indicated that there was something that had to be coped with at once. And Jean, I saw that. The socialists weren't very good about it. Uh, in the first place, uh, the socialists felt that this was a family quarrel of two clans of the bourgeoisie. And they made the parliamentary deputies made a manifesto or a, 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 a resolution of that kind on the 14th of January of 1898, which they published. They said the socialists have no interest in a quarrel between two bourgeois factions and consequently must steer clear. In the elections of May of 1898, very few socialists really stood as strong pro-Dreyfus people. They didn't want to really stir that issue up. Jolas did. He was beaten in those elections of 1898, uh, beaten, as a matter of fact, uh, by a very concerted power play by the Marquis de Solange, who owned the big mining company, knowing that Jolas had, after all, been the great friend of those miners in the city of Carmel. But once he was defeated, Jolas was liberated. Uh, because then, he wasn't so afraid about not breaking the unity of those socialist deputies in the parliament, and he decided he would act. And what happened was that on the 7th of July of 1898, uh, the Minister of War went before the chamber. That was a man named Kamehameha. Coming up, said, I still hear talk of this greatness affair. And that's very annoying, and so I will lay it to rest. I just happen to have from the dossier put together by Colonel Audley three new documents. Uh, which proved the guilt of Dreyfus. And so Anli had produced three new documents, uh, which Carpignac then read. Well, of course, they stank. I mean, they were so obvious from a, a broad distance. And that's all that Jonas needed. 
And so, well, he winds up. He really does wind up. And what you get are a series of flood of articles, the newspaper, La Petite République, which are put together later as one of the great books ever written on the affair, uh, which is called Les Preux, The Proofs. And it's half Inspector Meglet, uh, if you like those detective stories, because he does go after the proofs as they're presented. And it's quite magnificent from that point of view. But half of it, half of it is Victor Hugo in the Châtiment. Half of it is a tremendous, tremendous attack upon the political ploy involved in this uh, early 20th century water game. And so what Joas underscores, two things that are very important for you to know. One is, he says, you see, the question of whether Dreyfus is proletarian or bourgeois is a wholly silly, stupid question. That when you define an oppressed person, you define a proletarian. That the proletariat is the class of oppression. That it is oppressed every day. So that no matter what a person is subjectively, when he or she is the victim of that machinery of oppression, he or she is proletarian objectively. And the same force is crushing him down. And that, you see, already is a kind of foreshadowing of that magnificent cry in May of 1968, when the government, after all, looking at those no sheets in that uprising, were saying they're led by a filthy German Jew, and that, of course, convented, and that magnificent surge in the Place de la Sorbonne, in which they began to shout, we are all German Jews, we are all German Jews, because if he is oppressed by them, so are we, and there is that communality of oppression. And the second thing Jerome said is there is something absolutely important about this affair because it shows us what is key. It shows us what we have known, who have looked at it closely, but that the public doesn't know that. It shows us so clearly what Les Lombetans is, what repression is, what complicity is in these affairs. But the problem for Jaurès was how the Socialist Party could take over the movement. Because what the real problem was, was that the Dreyfus movement was very mixed socially. That is, lots of bourgeois got into it. Republicans who didn't want that movement to get out of hand. And so what Jaurès said, there is only one way to do this, and that is party unity. If we have one unified party out of all of our socialists, then we can get into this movement and we really can inflect it in a socialist direction. We can direct a mass assault upon this, these instruments of repression. And so he called for that unity. It was hard to come by. The little parties and sects had vested interests in their autonomy. But by the end of 1898, there is a committee of entente, or a committee of unification that is formed as a kind of first step toward unity, and then you see the whole strategy blows up. And the whole strategy blows up. Would you like, incidentally, uh, I can go on, and uh, I am going to, but uh, anybody that really has to leave, you all right? And it exploded really on the basis of a very, very curious and anguished view that crumbled the French socialist movement between 1899 and 1905, that really caused that movement to be divided for more than five years. The issue of what we call millirondism, or the issue of ministerial participation. In its simplest terms, it simply is that in June of 1899, a socialist, a well-known socialist, Alexandre Villemon, on his own initiative, decided to accept a position in the cabinet, in the ministry, of the bourgeois prime minister, René Valdez-Rousseau, in order to become the minister of commerce and labor. And once he accepted the bourgeois ministry, all hell low through. Because, you see, what happened earlier, before the formation of the Valdez Rousseau ministry, there had been a government that had been headed by Dupuy. And that government had persistently refused to draw the implications of the Dreyfus affair clearly. And so Dupuy had uh, fallen on the 12th of June. And when Valdez Rousseau, who was himself a corporation lawyer, who himself had been into various co-opted tactics earlier, and before he had been 
law recognizing trade unions in order to try to legalize the actions of workers, Bismarck and Rousseau headed up what was called a government of Republican defense. The idea being that this government would begin to flip the wings of the army, that it would begin to flip the wings of the church, and that it would dissolve the patriotic and anti-Semitic leagues. In other words, that it would restore a different kind of order uh, than the army and that the ultra-nationalists wanted. And consequently, it seemed on the face of it that the socialists ought to have some participation in that. At any rate, Millevon entered into the Valdec Rousseau ministry. But as soon as he did, all hell broke Bruce. A tremendous storm broke across the entire socialist movement because it divided the movement very artificially, I should point out, divided the movement into two camps, the camps of so-called ministerialists and anti-ministerialists. Those who believed that a socialist would go into a bourgeois ministry, and those who thought that somehow it corrupted socialism if such a thing happened. And that, uh, those ministerialists and anti-ministerialists really break into reformists and revolutionaries. Uh, those who are ministerialists being much more reformist, thinking that reforms have a place in the socialist strategy, of uh, the others being so-called revolutionaries, and feeling suddenly that all reformism is something that is a sellout of the movement. In fact, you see, and this is the real tragedy of French socialism at that particular point, the uh, question of militarism was an authentic question. It was an authentic issue, but it was not authentic in the way in which it was phrased. You you can't imagine how virginal those people were. They really were having absolute fix over the fact that a socialist was sitting in a bourgeois ministry. Now, you see, we have all kinds of experience. We see socialists become colonial, uh, uh, colonial governors. Uh, we've seen them chart the Cold War. Uh, we've seen them chart, for example, uh, the war in Algeria and so forth. And we don't have any of that virginal sense. But this is 1899, and the idea that Milevon should go in and sit in a ministry next to a minister of war who was General Gagalife and who had been one of the people who had shot down Communal. No, no. What you will do, after all, is to destroy the integrity of the movement, or you will destroy, certainly, of the integrity of the working class. And consequently, there was that kind of a reaction. But the way the issue was posed by these anti-ministerialists was always in terms of, do you defile the movement? Do you corrupt the movement simply by ministerial participation? That wasn't the question. The question really was, after Milleroptism, what? In other words, the question was to use the ministerial participation, that is the penetration of a socialist into the government, to use that as the point of departure for a very real inquiry or debate on what the limitations of democratic legalistic practice were. And then, really to chart another course. In other words, to chart something to supplement it, to go beyond it, to penetrate beyond the frontiers of legalism. And that, the so-called revolution the anti-ministerials never did. What they did was say, we are revolutionaries, we don't like the Levant in this particular government, and consequently, we call ourselves pure, but they never charted or worked out any other strategy of confrontation with the system. The whole question of militantism could have raised that. The question of entry itself is a secondary issue. Joles said it very well. He said, what difference does it make, for example, if you elect deputies, if you elect mayors, if you elect municipal councillors, or if you put somebody into the ministry? It's all part of the same process of penetrating the system and presumably trying to sap it from within. But it should never rule out the use of other strategies and the use of other tactics. But that's not how that debate went. The debate, after all, was open by a joint manifesto by the Geddes and the Marquis on the 14th of July of 1899, as though they had really rediscovered socialist purity. And so the joint Geddes Blanquist Manifesto, after they had spent years, you see, in reformist and electoral action themselves, we must be done with deviations from our socialist goal. Our movement would, would be committing suicide if we permitted our party, a class party, to become a ministerial party. We are and we must remain a party of opposition. 
And there is Paul Lafave, who gives these arguments, their most classic form, in a brochure called Socialism and the Conquest of Power, in which he, first of all, talks about the fact that any kind of ministerialism, any kind of inviting of socialists into government roles, is a means of seduction, is a way, really, of muting the movement, a platonic concession to dampen the ardor of the party. Its revolutionary role is thereby finished. And then he makes his accusation, and he says all of this is due to the fact that newcomers have come into the party in this period of the Dreyfus Affair, and these newcomers, without any tradition of struggle, want to turn us into a, an opportunistic party. Newcomers in the party would reduce the socialist movement to the left wing of radicalism. And you see, all of that left a lot of questions unanswered. It left unanswered the question, for example, of why it was that the Geddes and the Blancists themselves were reformists in the course of the 1890s, before the newcomers came in. And it certainly left unanswered Jolès's question of what difference is there between a socialist minister or a socialist mayor or a socialist deputy, but fundamentally what it did was to void the whole area of other strategies. Now in that, Jolès was much better. Because, you see, at the end of 1898, he didn't think that uh, millerandism or ministerial participation was going to be a way of coping with this uh, apparatus of repression. For him, the whole idea was how do we dismantle something that really is, is stifling us, something that really is, is oppressing uh, the popular classes. And consequently, uh, what he thought at the end of 1898 was that the general strike or the mass strike might be a very good instrument if the party state it got unified, if it could lead some kind of a popular mass movement. But you see, the conditions weren't there. They weren't there because the party wasn't unified and because the CGT, the General Confederation of Labor, wasn't having anything to do with politicians and with parties anyway. And so you get down to June of 1899. And Jolès hesitates at first about Milan, and he thinks, well, uh, he's really an ambitious guy, and it probably is dangerous that he's gone in. He's not really a, a revolutionary, certainly not a socialist. Uh, he's a, a kind of a class collaborator, and consequently, it is a bit dangerous that he's gone in. Furthermore, it will probably destroy unity. But how can the socialists not do something? How can they not do everything that is available to them? That's the, the, the Jolas strategy, that whatever is available, at least you try to do. So he came out in support of Millerandism, but always with the proviso that it wasn't the end-all and the be-all of socialist action, that other things really had to come to supplement it. The tragedy is other things never came to supplement it. Uh, his own party, uh, namely the groups that he dealt with, didn't have the revolutionaries in them. The revolutionaries were off in their own isolation, and consequently, Jolès was surrounded, literally, by a great number of opportunists. Well, just very briefly, what Millerandism does is, is basically threefold. Uh, what it does in the first place is to destroy, uh, for a period of time, the possibility of socialist unity, of really creating that kind of unified socialist party. Secondly, what it does is to displace the question of mass tactics. In other words, that question of mass tactics is really not raised in the whole framework of that Milleron uh, debate. And in the third place, what it did was to limit the kind of benefits uh, that the socialists could glean from the Dreyfus Affair. If you want to know what those benefits are, they're very, very simple. In other words, some changes were made which were useful changes. In other words, under Valdec Rousseau, uh, the army was a little bit limited, just very little. Uh, the church was more limited, you know, because the ruling class could do without its bishops much easier than without its generals. But it suffices to say that for the army, uh, some of the most conspicuous uh, uh, fabricators of documents and so forth were obviously put in retirement. Uh, the uh, ultra-nationalist leagues were dissolved. And then you do get, in 1905, under Com, under the succeeding ministry, the so-called Ministry of the Left Bloc, you do get the law of two years, the military law of two years, uh, which reduces military service from three years to two. But I want to point out something about that, and that is that the army is never frontally attacked. This bourgeoisie that's safeguarding the republic, it's not going to undermine the instrument that it is its instrument of social order, that uh, its instrument of social conservation either. 
Uh, the church, yes. Uh, you finally have the law and associations of 1901, uh, which means that the uh, religious orders can't teach. In other words, you suppress all of the schools uh, run by the religious orders. But then, finally, in 1905, separation of church and state, uh, which means that the state will not pay the salary of the clergy. But that's relatively minimal. The repressive machinery is still there. What really shows the potential of this whole Dreyfus Alps strategy uh, is the development of these popular universities, these Universités Populaires. They emerged out of the Dreyfus period. Uh, they had very much of the push behind them of certain of these young intellectual socialists who had come into the movement at the time of the Dreyfus affair. And what they were were workers' universities, or let's say workers' courses. Uh, rather a terrific kind of program in which the intelligentsia uh, organized courses, whether in the Bulls de Travail, or in some other locale, or organize Kosali, just discussions or round tables, and consequently try to raise, raise uh, the not only the cultural level, but the uh, widen the political horizons of workers. Now, I don't want to say that these are always successful, uh, because quite obviously workers come home after 12 hours of work or 10 hours of work, uh, and uh, there are teachers or there are intellectuals who really are talking a somewhat inflated language. Uh, the problem of communication was very great. Uh, furthermore, there were some people involved in these universités populaires who really were using them to try to co-opt the workers, but it was a fundamental experiment. I can't go into it in detail. Something I know a lot about and is fascinating because the confrontation between the workers and the intelligentsia between 1899 and 1902 was richer in France uh, than it ever was after that. And there really was some effort to say, all right, you people have to know what your lives and what your society is about. Very much the same kind of thing that Fernand Pelletier uh, said about his book. Uh, unity, yes, unity came to the French Socialist Party finally. And it came at a congress in April of 1905 at the Salle du Globe, the so-called Globe Congress. And that unity, of course, as we know, was ordered by the Second International. The Congress of Amsterdam of 1904 had done two things, both of which presumably were directed at Jolais. One, Ghent had introduced a resolution that the Germans accepted, and that resolution said all forms of constant collaboration, all forms of reformism must be condemned. And they were looking right at Jolais because he had been collaborating in the full thought ministries to try to dismantle this repressive machinery. Well, he got the, got the challenge, and he really lifted the gauntlet because it's that moment that I mentioned to you before when he turned to Babel, who said you can't be a reformist, and he said, I want to know what you people are in Germany. He said, you just got three billion votes in this election. We're meeting in Amsterdam because your government said we couldn't meet in Berlin and you couldn't oppose them. And even if you got 20 million votes, there's nothing in your constitution that says that the emperor has to call you to power. And consequently, you're a paper tiger, and you hide your impotence, and Kautsky helps you hide it, because he keeps writing revolutionary phrases and creating these puffs of smoke. But nonetheless, this resolution against reformism was passed, or less accepted it, and that was followed by another resolution that said, on the basis of the principles of the Second International, presumably revolutionary, that in every country there must be one socialist party, that the socialist parties must unify, and consequently, Jolès, who headed up a little socialist party called the Parti Socialiste Francais, Jolès decided, yes, it is time for this, it is time that we leave the left bloc, it is time to get socialist unity, and he, more than anyone else, pushed it, and consequently, at the Globe Congress in April 1905, it was done. Well, you see, you have then 10 years of unity. 1905 to 1914. Those 10 years of unity, the statistics are impressive. Uh, you start with 35,000 socialists or inscribed members in 1905. You have 71,000 in 1914. In the elections, the general elections of 1914, the socialists got 1,400,000 votes and they elected 103 deputies. They become a big party. Elect them exactly because within the framework of that SFEO, as it's called, 
of that SFIO, which is the uh, section on international the uh, uh, section Francaise de l'International Ouvrière, uh, the French section of the Workers International, which is the French Socialist Party. That SFEO, even though it grows big, even though the figures are impressive, really never accomplishes a great deal. Its deputies in the Parliament harangue, they put forth laws, and they're very rarely passed. And consequently, you're dealing with a party that itself doesn't seem to make very much accomplishment. But let me make the one point of differentiation again. It's very interesting. And the point of differentiation is that there always is built into it the possibility of a mass strategy. And that again is Jean Assis. Because he goes to the Congress of Limoges in 1906 to debate the question of the general strike as it is used by the General Confederation of Labor. How should the socialists adapt to the syndicalist movement? And Jaurès is one of the few who says, there's nothing wrong with the general strike. It's a magnificent instrument, and it's better that we have in France a revolutionary, a trade union movement, rather than a reformist one. So he says in his speech at Limoges, to reduce the union to a purely bargaining role is to destroy it. As for myself, I am happy that French workers have gone beyond reformism to aim for the overthrow of capitalism by the organization and preparation of the general strike. For the general strike means that the working class is a collectivity, a bloc de travail, which can refuse the work imposed upon it and the society which imposes it. And what he goes on to say in that speech is, I love the general strike because it galvanizes the unity of the workers and it scares the hell out of the capitalists. And consequently, in that sense, an instrument always uh, appreciated within the framework of syndicalism by Jolas, but appreciated also as a possibility within the cadre of socialist action and within the uh, armory of socialist weaponry. Most magnificent in the campaign against war. Now, Jaurès was all over in those last six years. And the very performance is an action role. That is, it's a role of activism or a role of action. Uh, you know, for a man, just as a parenthesis, he introduced a bill, a table to bill in 1910 in the Parliament, to reorganize the French army. You see, uh, the, the bourgeois republicans weren't going to destroy that army. Jaurès uh, tabled a bill to reorganize the whole French army, and then thought he needed a solid argument, wrote a 912-page book, uh, which he then appended to the bill, uh, and uh, consequently spread around. I don't know how many parliamentary deputies read it, uh, but it suffices to say that was that marvelous book, uh, La Main Nouvelle, The New Army, in which he really talked about the fact that unless you have an army in a society that can never be offensive but only defensive, you are really in trouble, and your ruling class will go off into imperialistic ventures. And so you have a Jaurès, you see, uh, who is talking about imperialism, uh, is opposing the Moroccan conquest, is saying in 1912 in the Chamber of Deputies that to conquer Morocco now is madness, that we are on the verge of a third world revolution, and people will demand, after all, their liberation, and then war itself, war itself. And so you get Jaurès in November of 1912. And you get him at the Congress of Basel. The Second International has held an emergency Congress to try to say something about the threat of war. And 555 socialists are there, and they meet in the Cathedral of Basel. And the chimes are ringing when Joas goes in, and he has no notes. And what ensued was, of course, one of the great speeches made in the history of socialist rhetoric. And he improvised this. I think of the motto which Schiller inscribed at the head of his beautiful Song of the Bell. We were woke I call on the living to resist the monster which would ravage the land. Mortuos Flambo. I weep for the countless dead, now buried in the east, whose running stench fills us with remorse. I will harness the thunderbolts of war now breaking across the skies. And consequently, try to commit the Second International really to something very solid by way of an international strategy against war. Came back from Basel and wrote in the money pay 
It is imperialism which has so skillfully and treacherously roused the, aroused the racism and the vanity of whole populations. It is this patriotism of aggressive capitalism which has fused deep-seated atomistic instincts with modern financial intrigues. Capitalism has rendered the human mass inert and insecure. It has reduced human beings to seeking emotional gratification in the drum beating of chauvinism in the fever pitch of raging warfare. At such a low level has human energy been kept by an oligarchy which has reserved for itself all the real rewards of life. So the final stage comes on the eve of war. The International Socialist Bureau, the Bureau of the Second International, meets in that last emergency session, the 29th of June of 1914, and war really is imminent, and Charles will live only two more days. And he gets up with a racking headache. He suffered very badly from migraine headache, got up in the Maison de Peuple packed house, and then made that last speech and that about war, and he said, when typhus finishes the work begun by bullets, disillusioned men will turn on their rulers. They will demand their explanation for all those corpses. Then the unchained revolution will cry out to them, be God, and ask pardon of God and man. It was Jovas's last word in terms of a public address that was recorded, which was, you make war, you will have revolution. And so there was revolution. Unfortunately, lots of counter-revolution too. But it suffices to say that there is that element of flexibility within the framework of something that was very pre-war in French socialism, but it is fertile, and fertile enough really to have plowed, because it is a little bit different, that strange SFEO, for all of that curious flexibility of mass action that occasionally covers at the very heart of it.